We have a special guest today. He is the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only, the street apologist, Vocab Malone. Vocab, welcome to But What Does the Bible Say? And uh, thank you for coming. Hey, thanks for having me on, Rodney. I don't feel like I had to go anywhere. <laughs> so if you could, uh, just for our guests or for our listeners and our viewers, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Vocab. And uh, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, South Side, representing these days. I live in downtown Phoenix, and um, I'm an apologist, and I got into that because of my own questions, which led me to evangelism, which led me into apologetics, which eventually took me from the street to the Internet. And then being on the Internet, you see here what's going on. So I went into radio, then to live streaming, and then... Writing, I was blogging <laughs> before, but now books. There you go. Yes. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, so if you don't know, that's already uh, street level apologetics available on Amazon. There you go. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Yeah, yeah, you like that? Yes, sir. All right. So with writing the book, okay, you 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 wrote this book, and who exactly is this book really geared for? If you share the gospel in your current context or if you want to that's listen so it is for christians and christians who are engaged helps them along the way encourages them or christians who want to be more engaged hopefully inspires them to become more engaged with uh, the issues of the day and present jesus as the answer and try to give some tips techniques but ultimately the foundation undergirding it is scripture so get into the book of acts and try to get some examples from there look at jesus's interactions with people stuff like that okay now i, see, I do see d new in the uh chat so since we do see d, d new in there uh who else was involved with this book with you <laughs> well a person you've had as a guest on your program right there if you look boom adam coleman there you go and mj jackson and then a number of other people, really, some folks from Ohio helped out uh, as far as uh, interior design and then with the cover, a brother from Chicago, and then my homie Mike from Phoenix laying everything out. And so a lot of uh, hands made it happen, and it really takes a team to make something like this go down. And right. it came out the gates on Amazon, and for a self-published book, it has done very well. Good. That's really good to hear. And I know if you need to, or if you should, if you have the book, make sure you leave a review on Amazon. That will help out with spreading that. It makes a big difference. We definitely need more reviews. I think there's yes. 16 or so up there now, and they're, uh, they've all been a pleasure to read. So shout out to the people who have reviewed the book. Yeah. Now, what is, if you could, just give us a brief synopsis of what the book is really about. I mean, we know it's about street-level apologetics mm -hmm. from the title, but what where does it really tell us well um you want to know why you should share the gospel and then you get the answer from scripture so this is a motivation for the christian you want to know how you get the answer from scripture so this is some um a, a equipping for the christian to do what they're supposed okay. to do and then uh adam and mj come along in the middle and really show some of the challenges at the street level, especially in the city context. So right. the book does have a aim at the city. The okay. city is a the passion, the heartbeat. I mean, the subtitle is passion for the city, clarity for the people. And so uh, mainly them, I contribute a little bit to those three chapters there in the middle. Talk about some of the issues facing communities in the city, especially black and brown communities. Right. And uh, some of the issues that are being raised. And so it gives you a good overview of the land. So if you have a gap in your understanding, it'll help fill that a little bit, give you more wisdom and tact, hopefully, as you go out. Right. And then even if you're already aware of these things, it still gives you some resources, some helpful talking points about how to engage some of these folks from different worldviews, from the Kemetic folks of the Hebrews, the lights, to the Afrocentric atheists and things like that. Yeah. All right. So now when we talk about apologetics, um, a lot of people get confused with apologetics and who is an apologist and who isn't, et cetera. Uh, so when we first look um, 
at the misconceptions regarding apologetics in an attempt to keep, and I know that this can sometimes sound hyperbolic when I say most, and I'm not meaning it to be hyperbolic, uh, but a lot of people out there want to say things like um, that apologetics is for the debate stage or even on the street level, you know what I'm saying, that it's kind of a show. Uh, what what do you have to say to people who think that it's not part of their Christian walk to be an apologist, that, it, that it's just for that debate stage? Well, you know, I bring out in the book how 1 Peter 3.15 is written by a fisherman. <laughs> you, know, you could say fisherman turned apostle, but, but I mean, I think once a fisherman, always a fisherman. Oh, yeah. By a fisherman to normal congregational Christians. Mm -hmm. And so the apostolic authority that, that he has goes uh, to every Christian, basically. And there's, there's not a special class or exceptions or anything like that. And what does he say? He says, you know, first and foremost, you set Christ apart. He's sanctified in your heart and the core of your being. You're dedicated absolutely 100% to his lordship. I'm paraphrasing what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, but I believe that is what he says. And then he goes on to say, always be prepared to give an answer or defense for the hope that is inside you. And people have heard the scripture a lot, but I think that first thing is really important. And that's why I start out the book talking about something I call the pit bull state of mind. And okay. then I reiterate that in more technical terms later on, I think in chapter seven. And uh, the idea is there the grasping, gripping, grabbing, holding on to Christ first and foremost as your Lord, no matter what you hear, and also as the center topic of conversation, right? And I think that's what First Peter three fifteen says in the beginning part there. And then you go on, and he's talking about giving an answer, and that, that's a great passage. But there's also some other great ones like Colossians four five six, and I bring that passage up frequently there. And Paul talks about, you know, you walk wise towards outsiders and that you know how you ought to answer each one and that you've got some salt and grace in your answer. Right. And that's a beautiful passage to break down a little bit as well. And those are not the only places, but those show that this idea of uh, giving a, a defense, an explanation, and I would even say maybe we could say a vindication uh, the okay. truthfulness of Christianity, when you do that faithfully and when you do that uh, truthfully, um, uh, the gospel can really shine through that. Now, the Lord uses imperfect people, he uses us, but apologetics is something that we are to do. And uh, it's an art and it's a science. And so the more right. you do it by God's grace, if you're sober-minded about the process and as the Spirit m moves and guides, you should be able to get better and you know, hopefully this book has something to say that is helpful to people because it comes out of about two decades of experience. So right. that's the essence right there. Okay. So now do you think that because the, the debate stage gets so much limelight uh, that sometimes people, it causes that confusion uh, to think that, well, if the debate stage is, you know, I mean, when you see somebody like uh, Dr. James White and you see, you know, those guys up there battling out on stage or even, uh, when, I'm just saying, it, when you see that, do you think that can cause some confusion for, for the, especially the new believer who's like, man, I'll never get to that level of knowledge? You know, maybe, so, but I mean, it'd almost be like, you know, watching someone do a live Bible study and being like, oh my gosh, look at, you know, he's doing a live Bible study. It's so great. I, you know, this is something I'll never be able to attain. So I guess Bible study is just for that guy, you okay. know? It'd be, it'd be like that. I mean, these are spiritual disciplines are part of the Christian walk. You know, the Apostle Paul is talking constantly when his prayers and benedictions and introductions to churches that they would grow in knowledge, they would grow in grace. And this is an important element of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes uh, you'll hear people refer to it as the life of the mind, perhaps. But I mean, we're not supposed to be like anybody else. And so, right. you know, even my little book here, I'm showing you some things that I do, but then I draw to some ob objective sources as well. Like here's models, here's instructions. But then at the end of the day, there's flexibility. You know, there's going to be different styles and how people move in and out. Um, but there are some basic good do's and don'ts at the same time. And a lot of it is just your attitude and stance. And then you fill in the information as you go along. Right. People have different capacities for information and all of that. 
And okay, you know, but I think the most important thing is the foundation. It's it's sort of like the 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 mold that you're pouring it into. What does it look like? And and then the information will come and it'll go. And your ability to communicate, it'll come and right. it'll go. But as long as we're growing in those things, we should just be all right, however God made us. So this person debating on the stage, I mean, that's good for them. Praise God, we can learn from it. But yeah, we got our own local debates here, you yeah. know, and and we got our own local conversations here, right? And that's and really this book is about like a localized level of apologetics. Your city, your town, your block, your neighborhood. That is a key emphasis, and so get to know, get to know that, uh, get right. to get to learn that better, and kind of see what's going on around you. Right now, I mean, I think I think as far, especially when it comes to knowledge, I think sometimes people forget that we are supposed to love God not just with all of our heart and with all of our spirit and with all of our strength, but they also He also says in Mark twelve twenty nine through thirty, Jesus answered. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind mm -hmm. and with all of your strength. So that is an aspect to the Christian walk that we do need to remember that, that, that we need to remember also to do those things like study the scripture and understand why we believe what we believe. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. I think that would be a big part of apologetics as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, we can look at things as problems or challenges or opportunities, and often they're both. So let's say we're uh, dealing with the challenge of Hebrew Israelism. I look at it as a great opportunity. We Christians get to understand better because we're going to be studying more by God's grace, how the Old and New Testaments fit together. We get to understand better and grow in our knowledge of how the New Testament employs the Old Testament. We get to understand better continuity and discontinuity between Old and New Covenants, understanding uh, what what the what the law is and what it isn't and what it was intended for and what it wasn't intended for. Now, this these are not things uh, that I'm hashing out in great detail in the book. What I'm talking about now, although there there are sections where I explain theological terms and, and like layman's right. terms at street level, that is there. But my point is, we get to see these things. I would think as wow, what a, what a great what a great opportunity we have. So, you know, if if you just have a modicum of love for people, whoever it is you're talking to, maybe you know them well, maybe you don't, you'll want to be that light in their life. And so you'll want, by God's grace, to be driven to study these issues so you can have an intelligent conversation with them that hopefully will make them think, you know, and that's going to take some studying on your part. Now, I'm not into just my monologuing and dialoguing. You'll see I greatly borrow from Greg Kokel and Randy Newman, both okay. who have advocated very, very great, uh, they've done both done great work and great books on this topic of how to use questions in evangelism and questions in apologetics. And right. so I actually think the best thing is you get the knowledge and the information, you got that, that right heart attitude, and then you ask, that will show you much better how to ask the right questions. Because okay. these aren't just random questions. You 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 get better at using questions to to go where uh, where where the person needs to go. And you know Jesus did this. What does the law say? You know uh, he would ask them these questions, and the idea was to to show them these things, these truthful things. And uh, you know I th I mean he's the master example. So I have examples in there about apologetics of Jesus and the way he used the art of conversation as well. And uh, really, people should realize, oh, I can do that. I, yeah. I can do that. You don't have to have a master's degree. Now, education is great. I'm all for it. But this is not all it's about. Now, maybe getting this book, that's required. But the master's <laughs> degree is not required. <laughs> all right, man. So what, here, here, and I'm, kinda, I'm gonna use the Hebrew Israelites as, as uh, an example of this. When you're, when you're reaching out to these guys and, and debating these guys on the street, are you really, are you really trying to achieve uh, to reach the person that you're usually debating with? Or are you, are you more concentrating on the possibility of reaching the people who are around watching this? Uh, and maybe the people who, the, the, the new guy in the Hebrew Israelites that isn't real sure quite yet. Is that who you're more... Probably well, you know, with um, with uh, 
practice of something with continued repetition of something when the more you do it um it, it's good if you have good habits the good habits if if we're talking about good habits because this can happen right. with bad habits you don't want it to be with the bad habits the good habits become a second nature and what you're supposed to do uh can become almost instantaneous and so the answer to that question what you're saying for me is very flexible okay. like so you're this is not a person at work you're talking about where while i'm uh setting up a truck i'm talking to a guy and he says well yeah actually uh, i've never believed in any of that i'm an, i'm an atheist right. we're having a conversation this is out on the street with hebrews lights you asked about right and that is very in the moment so if i go up and there's guys there and uh their vibe is let's have an honest conversation as, as men of good faith discussing these issues uh, th that's my favorite thing i'd much rather go for that Right. If they don't want it recorded, okay. If they do, okay. And and then if that's the way the conversation goes, where it's people who disagree but are having an honest dialogue about these things, I'm not going to turn around and edit the video and make it be like, vocab destroy. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be like, right. a, I have one that says, vocab makes GMS Houston think. And on the cover, it's got them in a thoughtful pose, which is a pose they did while we were talking. So it's an image from the conversation. It's not like a, a fake thing. Right. And it just is a... The conversation basically of us have having a, a kind of a Bible study on the street. Now that's that is way more rare <laughs> than the battle type thing. But right. I'd much rather do the other one. But if I go up there and the right away, you know, they're uh, yelling at a passerby, and let's say that there's a, a female in our group, and they start calling her a bedwinge, and then uh, they're like, "Oh, this is gonna go on YouTube. We're gonna destroy," you know, you know, and all this stuff. Well, then I'm much more in the mode of this is straight up strictly uh, defending the flock against right. wolves. And so it's a much more battle type mode. But see, I still don't, I'm not the guy who still says, Rodney, that that's only for people on YouTube or the audience or whatever later, because I know how the Lord works and it could still be for any one of those guys standing there. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's, it's like I'm, I still have them in mind, but I got to approach it a, a certain way, you know what I mean? To hopefully get it, it make some uh, beneficial future use of it. But I still think it could be for those guys because, you know, there's two guys and maybe they're leading the thing. Then they're, you know, cutting you off and doing this and laughing and da, 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 whatever they're doing. But there's these guys on the edge and who knows how long they've been in it. Who knows right. if they agree with everything these other guys are doing. Now they're, now they're not really allowed to talk. But a lot of times those guys later, and uh, it's not always just the, hello, sir, how are you doing? Sometimes it's when someone's like, that's wrong. Let me tell you why. Sometimes they're like, whoa, a, a Christian who's confident in his belief and has reasons for it. I'm not used to that from the Christians. What's going on here? Yeah. So I say be flexible. But even that type of thing, you know, you're asking about sharing the gospels for everybody. Right. No, no options, people. <laughs> All right. You either send or you go. And it's best to be part of doing both. But in regards to, to uh, you know, uh, that particular thing, that particular direct, that may not be for everyone. I, we, uh, we understand that, right? That, that's a certain kind of thing. But I'm real flexible, man. And I try to, you know, and you don't do it all right, but you kind of think, okay, what's going on? And then, you know, like if those kinds of situations, the video might be Christian apologists shut cult down. It might <laughs> end up with that if that's, you know, if that's the way, the, the, because I want people to see uh, the gospel is true and these things are a lie. Watch, you know, because yeah. uh, so very situational for me with that. Right. So y there is that heart for the person who wants to have that honest conversation, which I think is, is, a, is it, it, it is important. Um, I mean, I spent 20 years on submarines and I talked to Adam about this a little bit too. And when you're on a submarine, it's, it's a microcosm of the, the United States essentially in a small steel tube. Uh, and with that, you're going to get the, de you're going to get those debates that happen, the, you know, religious debates and stuff like that, that I would, I came to Christ when I was halfway through that 20 year period. And so I would get guys who would come down to the torpedo room and want to debate me all the time. You know, atheists, you know, uh, would come down all the time. and want to have those discussions. <clears throat> now, when I was new to it, I think the thing that people need to get used to is if you don't know the answer to have the ability to say, well, you know what? I don't know that answer right now. 
but I can go look it up and find it for you. You know, I think that's that's important for people to understand that if you don't know the answer, be honest about that. You not knowing the answer and not try and throw something out there that's possibly false. So yeah, I mean, I literally see that page eleven. I learned the value of street apologetics from street evangelism. I also learned the value of stick to itiveness, which means unwavering perseverance, undaunted determination. Brothers and sisters, we must not be scared to fail. Don't worry about, right. quote, losing a debate. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer. And then follow that up with, but let me get your info and I'll contact you. A timely passage here is Colossians 4, 5, 6. So, you know, I, that's exa- you know, that's exactly uh, what I say there. And so, like, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, unless you know this and know that, I'm like, and people are like, oh, Christianity just took an L. I'm like, <laughs> Christianity does not depend on my success or failure. The whole of Christianity is not depending upon did I just get stumped. It, it'll be Damn. okay. It'll be all right. And it'll be all right for you, too. Christianity is not going <laughs> to fall because you gave the wrong answer in a debate. Right. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> well, I think I think we sometimes get confused between evangelism and apologetics. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? On the is there a crossover between evangelism and apologetics? Yeah, I mean, um, if you said, "Hey, Jesus is the Messiah, and uh, he was crucified on behalf of sinners, and he rose again on the third day and ascended to the Father, and he's going to come back and set up a perfect kingdom," do you believe this? If so, repent and trust in him. And every person was like. I understood everything you just said there, and I believe it all 100%. I now bow the knee to Jesus, and I will believe in my heart and confess with my mouth. If it was like that every time, I guess we could say we wouldn't need apologetics or something, although some, there's apologetic elements built right into what I just said, in my opinion. But let's just let's just say that, you know, and I, I guess so. But the way uh, witnessing is 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 whatever the conversation is, someone says, well, that's not quite right, or I don't think so. Haven't you read this book by so-and-so? I saw that in a movie once. I was watching the History Channel the other day. And so uh, automatically you're an apologetic encounter just by the nature of saying it. And you could even be, let's say the gospel is where you're trying to go. You could be over here discussing, you know, uh, were things created or evolved or is there a God, or you could be discussing these other but you're trying to go over there. And uh, I mean, th- these are apologetic issues. And so I know people will separate them out. Uh, but I think, yeah, they're closely related. I mean, you hear people say things like, you know, apologetics is like clearing the ground for evangelism or something like that. Right. Um, it's just like, you know, think about it. I mean, even in Peter's Acts chapter 2 sermon, there's apologetic elements. He's like showing how Jesus' death and resurrection fulfills messianic prophecy. He's referring to a prophecy that couldn't be just for David. And he talks about right. David's tomb is over there. It's very like, you know, but at the end it says they were cut to the heart. So that's where the, the, the Holy Spirit, this, this is his thing, but Jesus told us to go. And so we're in a strange way in the great commission working with the triune God, you know, instruments in the hands of the redeemer. And so I know they separate those out, but I just don't know how in any society, unless it was like a society that was 100% Christian. And does that really exist until, until uh, heaven? I don't think so. Where you wouldn't have apologetic issues as you evangelize in any way. And it doesn't have to be out on the street. It could be anywhere with your family, with whatever it is, they're going to be there. And so uh, I just, I think they're, they're just tied up together real tight, right. real tight. And um, that's, I, I don't separate them out too hard. And so this book is like, the, you know, on Amazon, you got to decide where you put it, what category. It's like, uh, number one, a category, you put in evangelism, and then number two, the category, put in apologetic category. Right. So that's the categories it's in because of that. And by the way, it made it, for the first week and a half, it was number one on new releases and evangelism. It made it up all the way to number two 
on apologetics only I couldn't get past C.S. Lewis's <laughs> new audio book. They did a, a new screw tape letters and we couldn't get past that. On new releases. Yeah. I mean, that is C.S. Lewis. So, <laughs> so uh, I just want everyone to know we would be number one were it not for C.S. Lewis. Lewis. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so for a, for a week, I, for, well, for a while, I was the only living apologist. <laughs> well, anyways, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> now, I mean, I think I agree with you. I think that every evangelist has to be an apologist because you are faced with that, answering those questions. But I think the one thing that um, evangelism takes into account that maybe apologetics doesn't is that relationship, it's trying to develop that relationship with that person also to help reach them. Uh, but I think Personally, I, I mean, I'm, I'm of the one who believes that it is God that saves, not us. So therefore, even though we are called to be a part of that, that, that process, it is him who saves, not, not us, not our words. We're not always the best representatives of Christ. So I think that we have to always keep that in mind also, that it is mm -hmm. God that saves. So, Amen. And, you know, that's a, a beautiful thing ultimately because we, we do – everything by God's grace we can. And then we realize we don't have to rely on uh, tricks or anything like that. Yeah. We can just be honest and truthful because uh, the Lord is going to, going to do the work. And so, um, you know, we don't have to, to do all this manipulation and stuff. We just try to be faithful. I think yeah. it's a big part of apologetic really is about faithful, uh, being a faithful witness. And we don't know what the results are going to be. You know, you look at examples in Acts where Paul is very faithful in his witness, and the result is they plot to kill him. You read the next right. line. I'll say, you know, he, he I think it's, is it Acts 9? I, th I think it is Acts 9 where it says, you know, he reasoned with them on the scriptures and he refuted them and debated, you know, and all. And then at the end it says they plotted to kill him. So, <laughs> so was he successful? Well, he's a faithful witness. And this is right after he was, uh, uh, became a Christian, I believe. Uh, yes, but the result, well, that was the result in that city, you yeah. know, but then he goes somewhere else. We, we just don't know. We can't control that part of it, right? And so just being a faithful witness is a, is a key element. And uh, and uh, I just, I, I think that as more Christians engage in any way with trying to share the truthfulness of Christianity, trying to share the gospel, trying to share who Jesus is and what he's done and what he's going to do, they'll realize, oh, apologetics is not really optional. I have to have some of this in my toolkit, or I'm yeah. just going to be constantly like hanging out with like, you know, one sentence and nothing else to say. You'll realize, I think, how vital it is the more you share the gospel. Yeah. And it's like, like I said, we've said this quite a bit so far is that it's, it's vital for us to all study and to study the scripture ourselves. I, I think sometimes people get so, um, they, they, I guess the way to phrase it is people limit themselves by saying, well, yeah, I, I know I need to study and learn more, but they just don't. And I think that we we need to, um, that's something that we need to work on within the church is helping people know that they can learn more, uh, that they are capable of opening up the scripture themselves at home and reading. Uh, I think one of the largest problems that we have in the Christian church is biblical illiteracy. Um, I think with that biblical literacy, we have people that don't uh, reach out evangelistic or with apologetics. Um, yeah, you know, uh, part three of the book, Street Level Theology, right when you go there to chapter 11, it's called Apologetics in the Church. And the idea is, like, here's some practical tips, issues about uh, how to do this in your local assembly. And it begins right. with Adam Coleman talking about how for him, a big part of what protected him from later on uh, Afrocentric style heresies and and uh, Christianity as a white man was religion talk and all that was that when he was younger, he was able to be exposed at a church he was at to uh, North African church history and, and learn names and people like Tertullian and Origen and Alexander of Alexandria and Athanasius and Augustine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And things along those right. lines really helped. <clears throat> and then, you know, I talk about, so that's important. And then I, I show some, you know, some church stats to try to give people a, an idea of, of what's going on, right? And then, okay, is there a way to in incorporate apologetic interests in preaching? Uh, 
And just right. a page and a half on that. What about even in in song and our worship and about a page or so on that? So nice little things to kind of get you thinking about, okay, what's a way that we can do this at a very local level? And uh, we can do it. And again, I just don't see why the why the church thinks they have much of a choice. Like we can, uh, you know, right. we can curse the darkness, as they say, or whistle as we go uh, strolling through the graveyard at night, or we can take our head up out of the sand and look around and be like, okay, this is that situation Jesus talked about where he's sending us out like sheep among wolves, and now it's time for us to be harmless as doves and yet clever and wise as serpents. And this is that this is that time. I mean, it's always been that time for the Christian, and right. it is still that time. So, ladies and gentlemen, oh, what are we doing here? You know, uh, Jesus didn't just <laughs> save you to 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 have you not go to hell and do well, God knows what. <laughs> In the meantime, <laughs> I mean, there's we're on a mission. So, you know, I, tell, I share some little stories in this book that I think, you know, they're true encounters, but they're not like these triumphal stories they're just sort of stories and things that happen on the road you know the ups and downs little things about when you're trying to share the gospel just to give people a sense or taste of what it might look like and to me you right. know people they want to do things like jump out of airplanes and that's fine or whatever uh, else kind of bungee jumping whatever other kind of thrills people want and that's fine okay okay if that's what you want to do but like there's a a, sen- a real sense of adventure and, and a true th- thrill when you when you say, "All right, I'm gonna step outside of my normal comfort zone. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go up to this person and hand them this this track. I'm gonna go even knock on a door. I'm gonna go uh, start this conversation, even though I don't know." You'll see. There's a real sense of adventure, and you'll be constantly surprised and thrilled about the things that happen. And so I I try to instill a sense of, "Oh, that could happen." Well, let me. I want to see what will my uh, story be how will god use me what's right. the good and the bad that's about to happen you know <laughs> it'll be both yes yeah I, I think that a lot of times people uh don't realize how much they can touch somebody's life in their uh their current relationships that they have like at work and places like that and it you know sometimes it is uh like right now i'm wearing a, a five stones t-shirt from uh five stones fight club uh, which is a MMA ministry up in up in Anvil, PA, that uh, that's ran by my brother-in-law. But it becomes a conversation starter for people, and they say, "Hey, what what is Five Stones?" You know, and so when I tell them about Five Stones Fight Club and then what they do there and how they reach into the local community and help people who are uh, struggling with drug addiction and help people that are alcoholics and help people who are uh, and they get them into the gym and get them started. And a lot of times they bring in kids that are at risk teens and stuff like that. And these, they end up forming those relationships with those people. And then that becomes an, an evangelistic opportunity for them to bring the gospel to them because they see that, Hey, here are these guys who say they're Christians and they're getting me off the street. They're helping me. I've been cleaned up. I've been, you know, I've learned, you know, a lot of self-defense and discipline in that process. Maybe I need to check this thing out, you know, and then God, of course, in that help helps do that work. I think sometimes having those, those, um, you know, um, conversation starters can help when people start asking me about that. Then we get into those conversations, uh, even when I wear this thing to work. So it's, you know, just little things like that always, I think help out. So. Yeah. I mean, we have so many, uh, avenues these days, I really feel like, and uh, you know, we can be stuck inside because of some COVID lockdown or whatever else happens <laughs> next. And somebody and, gets uh, started on a YouTube channel or something during that time. Yeah, the, the internet still exists. <laughs> I mean, I feel like um, I've been thinking about this lately, and and I don't know. I got to figure out where I need to go with this because I've been thinking. Okay, how does each Christian have a voice in the public square these days? How are we all part of the con- cultural conversation? Uh, how can we do that? Because I, I, I believe we should. And I'm like, man, is it a case where, like, every uh, all we should really encourage a large percentage of our people to to do something more, maybe bigger than what they thought they could on social media, right. and that might include teaching them and training them. And then you kind of sit around and start thinking, like, wait, I'm telling them to plug into the beast. What's that look like? You know. So, <laughs> so I don't know. I've been going back and forth uh, with some of that. 
because I, I really feel like, uh, hey, man, work while it's light. You know, we don't know yeah. how long we're going to have with these things. So, right. So do it, do it, do it, do it now, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I know uh, we've, um, I know I, for a while I was like avoiding some of the, the, uh, platforms that were out there. I know I just restarted my, my Insta or my, um, uh, Twitter account because I would, had been away from it for probably about three years or so where I just didn't have no, one. You didn't need to miss too much, man. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> I probably would have just got canceled anyways. So, but, uh, that's just cause of my mouth. So, uh, sometimes I'm not the most, uh, graceful. Sometimes I should be more graceful than I am. I have to admit to that. Uh, I think that's 20 years on submarines, uh, can kind of make you a little bit, um, what was it? Uh, sarcasm becomes our first language on submarines. So, well, I mean, <laughs> I guess the phrase curse like a sailor, you know, there's a, a reason why that it came into the vernacular. Eh? Yes. Yes. Um, but, uh, let's see. Do you have any good suggestions uh, for launching points for somebody to get, you know, in, or started in their studies for apologetics? I mean, I can think of one. <laughs> well, yeah, but you, you know what's interesting? Of, so about this little book, if you look, and in all seriousness, at the end of every chapter, including mm-hmm. even, uh, you know, the introduction, there's a little section that says further reading. Further reading. Because this book is... um. I feel like, you know, any, honestly, any high schooler should be able to um, be able to go through this and not have a problem. Right. And and so what I want to point people to then is, is uh, other stuff that branches out farther, some good resources. And usually there's about six at the end of every chapter. And even inside the book itself, at the end... Um, I did something a little bit different. We'll see what the success or not of that is, is part four, appendices, glossary, and endnotes. And not the glossary, you know, or not the endnotes, but the, the appendices. I included uh, historic church creeds and confessions, right. not, not all of them or anything. But the idea is like, okay, here's what we're promoting and proclaiming um, the, historically. Like th- this is the idea to include that part, as part of the conversation, like, and here's what we believe, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what Christians believe. So, an awareness of the historic church before us, and 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 that's what what it is that we're talking about. Because the book is not a systematic theology per se. So I have things like that there, and so there's some resources even there. But the footnotes as well do go deeper. Uh, if you look, there's 160 footnotes, and they also go farther along. So between those, there's, a, there's some great stuff. Like just. Like in chapter 10, I mentioned uh, the Christ myth. And then if you notice, several of the resources uh, deal with the Christ myth, you know, unmasking the pagan Christ, zeitgeist, the movie exposed, conspiracies in the cross. And so I, those things are right there. So you really can go farther. I'm trying to set up the, the basic framework and then people pour the content and information in and they can do that with the further resources. I mean, if you bought all the books in here, you'd probably... The, that are that are listed for the reading, you, you'd have uh, oh, psh, not quite fifty. Or, I'm sorry, all, all, more than fifty, uh, almost a hundred books. It'd be a great apologetics library to start out. But you can yeah. get a sense of them as you look at them. So there's some resources even right there. And reading is, I don't know, I don't know. I, I watching videos is good, but um, theology books, see. theology books are an addiction, by the way. So y- yeah, they can be, you know, a paper <laughs> addiction. I just don't. <laughs> See how to really uh, do this seriously. You can avoid uh, reading and um, yeah. reading. Uh, probably physical books is the best. Digital books is the next best. And I, I mean, I'm saying generally speaking, but also you know, there's uh, audio books. Almost almost everything is an audio book these days. It wasn't always like that. And yeah. you know, you, you used to go buy these big physical cassettes or or or, or CDs. You don't have to do that. You can download them. There they are. Go through. Boom. So we have some great resources. And then, you know, instead, people just walk around all day. Instead, listening to little, uh, I don't know, who's a little Yachty and a baby or some, yeah. some some like nonsense instead of all this <laughs> these resources we could be listening to. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that we also have a problem with is this. We end up, you know you know, tuned into our cell phone across, you know, several 
uh, platforms or whatever, checking our Instagram status, that kind of stuff. I think sometimes people get too uh, involved in that. And uh, even, I know I just did an episode on, on Disney Plus and Disney. And I think sometimes we get too involved with what we're watching on TV and stuff like that when we could be reading and and learning and spending time in God's word and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go or that you can't enjoy entertainment, but at the same time, it's how much. I think sometimes we we have a tendency to over emphasize entertainment versus what we really should be doing, especially as God's people. So no doubt. I mean, also I'm more and more of the conviction that uh almost every Christian's got at least one good book inside of them. Now maybe a short book. But I really feel like, you know, just more and more, we should really think about what it means to be a people who are content producers. Um, right. Not that we were, you know, always the, the best and the brightest, but, you know, Christians have done some innovative things in regards to media. If you study throughout history, for example, the, the, codec, the codex, the book form for, for, for ancient documents, they weren't ancient at the time. They were using them. They were just documents. Right. But what are now ancient documents – that was something really pioneered and revolutionized, it, it appears, mainly by Christians. And there's a number of kind of technical books on this. And it, it's a fascinating thing when you study it. And it mainly seems to have to do with the the, the desire to, to have portable mobile uh, reading as well as things that you can have collections of. And so, you know, the the bound book, as it were, was something that, that really became uh, really promulgated and, and perpetuated, especially by the early church. Um, and you can almost always know that if you find something and it's a scroll, for example, it's a biblical text, it's almost like a given, well, this is this is he this is uh Hebraic in origin. This is of the Jews because it's stays in the synagogue, for example. I mean I'm simplifying right. it a little bit, but then you go on to, you know, I'm skipping way to the 20th century, but the advent of radio and some of the first people to really get on there and really see the power the potential power of radio were Christians, were preachers, were right. those kinds of folks. And that was that was innovative media at the time. I mean, imagine being able to just only people right then that could hear you and then it'd have to be printed about to be spread to all of a sudden they can hear you audibly all over the world hypothetically. Oh, and yeah. then if it's recorded, it could sort of live. I mean, that's amazing. And so, and to a, to a certain extent, maybe lesser extent, but TV as well. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And, and you know, I understand, you know, we can talk about the, the deck stack, stacked against us and all these kinds of things. But look, when has it not been? I mean, we didn't have the resources of the Roman Empire at our disposal for uh, 300 years as Christians. Right. And nonetheless, hey. And so I, I just feel like we could do so much so much so much more as as content producers and if we're gospel saturated people all of our, our the content that we're putting out will, will be a light to the world whether it's christian fiction you know I, i'm a guy who's about the arts uh, right uh, whether it's the quality christian music whatever it is i mean these things make a big difference and more and more you see the way culture shapes so many things Meaning like even like pop culture shaping things, you know, right. that's why, you know, it's what a funny thing that, uh, you know, people um, are like, well, what's on Obama's playlist on his iPod this year? And now they don't say iPod, but at the time it was like, what's he listening to his iPod? <laughs> what, yeah. what an interesting thing. Like we wouldn't have really, I don't think you would have had that, you know, imagine people saying, what's Richard, listen, what's, what's Richard Nixon listening to these days? We, <laughs> we need to get, we need to put that in Time Magazine, to find out his top 50 songs, you know, it would, but now there's this strange confluence. And that's why you see these guys on late night TV. Just, I'm going off a little bit, but I'm making the point of, of the way that we're in a different era and a right. different time. And, and um, you know, we can either sit around and complain about it or say, okay, how do we play right. ball? In this era, right? What, what what is a faithful way that we can do with what, what we've been given? And I think we yeah. can do a lot. I think we can do a lot yeah. more than we're I, doing. I, I, you know, that is one thing that I absolutely 100% agree with you on. I think we need more uh, Frank Peretti's, more Ted Decker's, more, you know, guys who can write. Uh, I know we talked about this uh, on a, a previous episode that we had about Christian entertainment in and of itself and why we... I think one of the big things that Christian entertainment is lacking is solid writers. I know they're out mm -hmm. there somewhere and I, and I wish we had them, you know, to, to really, to bring, bring their entertain or their, their value to the table and, and do stuff, you know, don't just sit mm -hmm. back. 
there have been yeah. some unique contributions. I've been getting to know some uh, bookstore owners lately, and I was asking them, like, okay, what about Christian fiction? What's big there? And uh, one of the things he was telling me about, and he was saying it's not as big as it is uh, is right. It's not as big now as it was. He's right. like, yeah, I don't know where it came from, but uh, the uh, Amish teen romance. I was like, what? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Apparently that's a I've big seen them on genre. The <laughs> Do you know about this? I seen them on the shelves I, I, at the at like Christian bookstores and stuff. And I'm like, I, you know what? I'm not even going to ask what I what guess the about. reason they're on the shelves is because people were buying them. He was telling yeah. me that was like, I was like, where did that come? How did that happen? I still want to know the story behind that. Like, how was it that, that Ash, uh, Amish teen romance books became a big thing within Christian fiction genre. But yep. hey, you know, it's a unique contribution. I mean, uh, we also gave the world vegetables without hands who can hold swords. So hey, you know, we do, we do, what, we, we, do what we can do. <laughs> but yeah, I, Dinu did say that she uh, liked uh, Ted Decker or loved Ted Decker also. Um, that was actually one of the best books, that, uh, some of the best books that I've used uh, when I was a Protestant lay leader on a submarine, were the Christian fiction stuff because those things that were those things weren't intimidating for people just to pick up and read, hmm. and not realizing sometimes that they were actually receiving through that some Christian theology. It's like when somebody reads The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, they might under, not understand exactly where J.R. Tolkien was coming from with his books. And the same way with like the Ted Decker books, when you open up the the book three a lot of times people don't understand where that's coming from. And then when they start reading it and they get deeper into it, they're like, Oh my goodness, I think I just learned something here. It, mm -hmm. And then I, I would start getting questions down in the torpedo room. You know, uh, I was a torpedo man in the Navy. That's why I keep saying torpedo room. Uh, but yeah, so it was, it was interesting to me to be able to use that Christian fiction to, to be able to also reach people. So yeah, you, you start a little library on the, on the, on the, on the boat for those who are Navy uh, next thing you know, you're going to have people asking questions. So Ted Decker, Frank Peretti are some good authors. Um, I know there's some other ones out there too. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can find, but. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, one of the most important things that they uh, learned from Lord of the Rings, at least the movie version, is the concept of second breakfast. <laughs> Although I think that's only in the movie, but still. Yes. Second breakfast, noon teas, tea time and all that. Yeah, it's, it's important. Uh, as a person who eats five, six meals a day myself, I completely uh, I feel, feel his pain mm -hmm. when I watch that in the movie. <laughs> yeah. What about second breakfast? <laughs> So just to, to move forward more, do you have any final thoughts for people? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to enc encourage people, you know, we're just kind of where we left off at that, that um, where, wherever you're at, God has put you in, in that position sovereignly. You know, Paul talks about this. He says, you know, the borders and the places in which they live, this is Acts 17 in his speech to the Athenians, uh, they're the Stoics and Epicureans. You know, God determined those things. And so if you're alive right now where, where you are, you know, God knew the year you would be born. And so there is something for you to do in this culture and in your context. And, you know, the original title of this book was actually Apologetics in Context. And okay. then I put it to street level because it had a dual meaning of at the actual street level and street level as a as a euphemism for, for t towards the average everyday person you know give it to right. me at the street level we say and so uh the idea is that, that there's something you can do there and then i'm trying to uh give people examples and models and and, and hopefully they use whatever's there about how to explain it uh properly and in a right. way that makes sense in whatever your context is. And so um, I would just encourage people like, it's kind of like that you, you can do this, you can share the gospel and you can do so with boldness and wisdom. It will take work, but it will be incredibly worth it. And so uh, that's it. And hopefully, you know, this little book will be one part of your journey, but uh, even if not, there's other great books and other great resources, and you can still do it in, 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 uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For real. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes. And also, Alt, remember that it is available on Amazon. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, oh sorry. Did no, away with it. There you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. There you go. All right, uh, Vocab, thank you very much for being on with us tonight. This is awesome having you on. And uh, uh, one question I was going to ask you, when, when, what actually got you your start before we leave in YouTube? Oh, in YouTube. Well, uh, so when it comes to YouTube specifically, so I had done some radio. Uh, when I first got into radio, it was on uh, the Christian hip hop side doing Christian hip hop shows. I did a show uh, first. The, it was called The Groove. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was along the lines of, what's up, y'all? This is Vocab. Welcome to The Groove. Something like that, you know, not yeah. quite. A, and then the show became Planet Hip Hop. Anyways, so I had a little bit of radio background and then a transition into doing urban apologetics on the radio i called okay. it backpack radio on the am you know and it was a unique concept we're going back a decade or more when we actually yeah 2008 we're going back more than a de decade when i started doing this and everyone's like that's not going to work what are you talking about and i was like oh whatever and so we did this street level apologetics that was one of the taglines street level apologetics for the 21st century and so um doing that and I was happy with that. I loved radio, inviting people into the studio, taking calls, whatever it was, right? Uh, but then David, David Wood, uh, we met up at a conference, and we already known each other, but he was kind of, uh, I don't know, hey, come out with us. We're going over here, and uh, don't worry, I got your meal. And I was like, what's going on here? I don't know. Well, sure, I'll just go wherever. I'm cool. And he starts talking to me, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, YouTube. You should do YouTube. I was like, I don't know nothing about that. I don't want to get into the video. I don't need to – I don't want to get dressed up to get on the microphone yeah. and this kind of stuff. I'll just stick on radio. And uh, over time, he convinced me through various means and methods. And then I was like, okay. And then he helped me. So it really wouldn't have been possible without that. And then I was like, whoa. Why was I paying those people for airtime on the radio when I right. could be on YouTube? And yeah, it costs a lot of work. But if you're monetized, which sometimes you're not, sometimes you are, right. you might even get fifteen dollars here or there. And over there, I was paying them a hundred dollars an hour. This might be a better idea after all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, that that's that that was the thing. So really, it was david wood shaking me up uh, out of my comfortability of being in radio which i loved and still love i want to one day go back and marry it all together yeah. uh, but but uh, for now uh, youtube is a primary thing uh as far as uh, that goes i think my first introduction to you vocab was on uh islamicize me yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah I, I i still hadn't started my own thing but david's like hey we could do this idea I was like, sure. I got some crazy ideas for your idea, because like he was like he had a crazy idea that he didn't think anybody would say yes to, but he's trying to find yeah. stu people stupid enough to do it. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Plus, I have some crazy ideas for it, and I gave him a couple right away. He's like, yeah, that's great. Oh my gosh, you know, including the name, and uh, it kind of just got worse or better from there, depending on your perspective. And right. then eventually, I was like, yeah. okay, we're we're done for now. I got a little break. Uh, I'll Try to start doing some stuff on YouTube. It's not always going to be, you know, 32 episode skits and all that. But right. let's let's go do this. And, uh, you know, just kind of snowball from there. But, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> man, Islamicize me has been definitely a curse and a blessing. Because every time yeah. uh, YouTube decides to go after David, it's always for an episode of Islamicize me. Same thing with yeah. me. It's like this thing sitting there that we're like, we love and we even wish was bigger. But then we also know YouTube might want to be like, hey, you know, there's a problem here. There's a problem there, you know. <laughs> Oh yeah, especially every time they adjust the algorithm oh, yeah. to pick on something, it's yeah. Uh... Yep, yep, yep. So all right, man. Well, thank you very much again for for coming on with us. Uh, vocab is good to have you here, and uh, it's it's been awesome. Uh, make sure you go and check out uh, Vocab's YouTube channel. Right there it is. Um, and I do have a link down below in the description, so you can go check it out. <laughs> And, brother, thank you very much for coming on. <laughs>